born in Cordoba and reared in Argentina just after the Second World War, young Carlos had a predestined choice of a career in medicine through a father and a mother who were themselves physicians. He graduated as a medical doctor 44 years ago at the National University of Rosario Medical School in Argentina and completed his surgical training four years later. To ensure a solid broad-based surgical training, he immigrated into the United States of America in 1975 and repeated a surgical residency in the University of Chicago. This now overtrained and post mature <laughs> surgical resident commenced, not surprisingly, an impressive academic journey as an assistant professor the Department of Surgery of the University of California in San Francisco in 1979, while he later rose to the post of Professor and Chair of Surgery from 1989 to 1992. But his, but his star was yet to shine luminously as if under the control of an electric dimmer wall switch, the brilliance of his star zoomed with his appointment to the professorial chair of the Department of Surgery at the Washington University, Seattle, Washington State in 1993, where since 1996 to date, he has been the first and only occupant of the Henry N. Hawkins Endowed Chair established in honor of the first chairman of the University of Washington Department of Surgery. <laughs> he is a master of many innovative approaches in surgical education, training, and practice, many of which have crystallized into teaching and training centers, uh, including, interestingly, uh, a non-belligerent ISIS acronym, <laughs> the Institute for Simulation and Interprofessional Studies. Reading through a 54-page curriculum VT is itself a daunting task. Attempting to browse through over 400 scientific publications, surgical movies and videos on the surgery of a gullet known to a few as the esophagus <laughs> and the science of swallowing is for me, at my vintage, an almost impossible assignment. But what is easily desirable is the thrust in surgical education and the transfer of relevant on-hand skills in minimal invasive surgery. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the West African College of Surgeons honors Dr. Carlos A. Pellegrini today as a man who, notwithstanding several personal achievements which are universally acknowledged, never forgot his humble but dignified beginnings in rural Argentina. He therefore has 
a comprehensive understanding of the trading challenges that face disadvantaged peoples and organizations, such as we in West Africa, still in search of our salvation. Time and space do not permit a full catalog of the various ways in which he had showed empathy. But the testimonies of past and present African and non-African residents under his watch in the United States were profuse in the details of his devotion, while many may not even have said it all. This testimonial, which I now recall, which is beyond my capacity to edit, is broadly representative of our inquiries. And I quote one of them. I've had the privilege of learning from the consummate professional, Dr. Carlos Pellegrini. He is a man of sincerity and truth, who leads by example and by action, who promotes honesty and excellence. There are countless principles which his trainees have learned from him, technical expertise, sound clinical judgment, management of complex foregut surgical patients, effective teaching tools, communication skills, etc., etc. It will be nearly impossible, he says, to single out one of the most important or the most appreciated. This grateful resident continued. But it is the overall professional conduct of this great man which has most impacted on us, his patients, staff, trainees, and colleagues. It is the way he listens at a moment of need. It is the unforeseen gesture of kindness. It is the handwritten note that he is never too busy to write. <laughs> it is the confidence of knowing that he will always be your best advocate. This is what I learned from Dr. Pellegrini. <clears throat> Therefore, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, by the authority of the President in Council, after due consideration of the recommendations of the Grants and Awards Committee of our College, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to present to you, Mr. President, Dr. Carlos Pellegrini, a citizen of the world and of the United States of America, Argentinian by birth, and origin, recipient of the Order of Military Medical Merit of the United States Army, member of over 50 surgical societies worldwide, supervisor of over 52 postgraduate doctoral fellowships, Henry Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Edinburgh, and Ireland, Chevalier de la Légion Honor of France, Henry Fellow of the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, former president of the American Surgical Association, immediate past president of the American College of Surgeons. Need I say more? Etc., etc. That you, Mr. President, sir, in addition to all this, might invest him with the fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons Honoris Causa. <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> Professor Carlos Alberto Pellegrini.
mon ami, professeur Carlos Pellegrini. With the authority vested in me by counsel, with the approval of fellows of the West African College of Surgeons, I confirm on you the honorary fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons. <coughs> Madame la Ministre de Santé, Monsieur le Ministre des Mines et de l'Industrie, Monsieur le Président du Collège Ouest-Africain de Chirurgiens, Professeur Oladid Ahi, Madame, Monsieur, je vous remercie pour l'honneur que m'a fait et je vous remercie à le nom de l'American College of Surgeons et comme un signe de l'amitié de l'American College of Surgeons avec le Collège ouest africain de chirurgiens et comme un signe de l'amitié des États-Unis avec les pays de la région ouest de l'Afrique et comme un signe de l'amitié de toutes les personnes du monde. Merci beaucoup. I was asked by the president to share with you some thoughts about leadership and why leadership is such an important aspect to surgeons. Leadership can be defined, or at least I define it as a combination of a meaningful vision and the ability to influence others by non-coercive means in a certain environment at a certain time and a certain circumstances. Why is it important to surgeons? It is important in your relationship with patients because you will have to convince the patients to do things. It is important in your relations to colleagues. It is important as you become leaders of departments. It is important as you create your research teams and it's also important as you try to advance policy. When one thinks about science and knowledge, one thinks that perhaps that could influence policy and inform policy, and yet there is a circle that has to go through. Science will not result in policy unless politics influenced by leadership result in adequate policy. Leadership used to be an individualistic character. Surgeons used to be told that it was the person that counted. Over time, the concept of working in teams emerged, initially as a result of modernization and the need to manage more complex patients, and lately, with an idea that high-performance teams, people working together towards one single mission, 
could achieve more things than one individual going along that. And a new concept has been advanced about a year or two ago of the clinical microsystems and the importance that leadership has in these clinical microsystems. If you think not just as the trunk of the tree, as the chief of surgery, for example, managing a hundred people, or a minister managing a thousand people, but you think of the branches of the tree and the leadership that is needed to manage all that portion of the tree, the clinical microsystems are just the little branches, more peripheral branches, that still need to have the effect of a leader. So leadership is something that must be exercised at every level. And my first messages to you, particularly the younger people, would be that leadership for the academic surgeon is a desirable trait to manage patients and departments and fellows. It's a desirable trait from a personal and society point of view. It's an, it's a, it's an activity that can be exercised at different levels and every person has the obligation to become a leader. And some may say, well, but I don't have what it takes to become a leader. I don't have the genes. But this slide shows you that genes participate on leadership, but so does the time and the circumstances. And more importantly, so does the will and inspiration that come from our own soul, from our own introspection, and from our own desire to help others. And that is what leadership is all about. So in doing that, a person brings up his or her own values, and in that sense, leadership is a very personal thing. So my second message is leaders are born, yes, but leaders are also the result of the circumstances, the results of time, and personal will and introspection allows people to decide to become leaders. And if you decide to become a leader, there are two stages as I see it. One stage that focuses in developing the leader and one stage that focuses in exercising leadership. On the first stage, it is important to remember that there are some aspects during the development time, honesty, honesty, integrity, practicing honesty and practicing integrity at every step of the way, recognizing opportunities as they present themselves, making adequate plans to develop, to move forward in the leadership, recognizing the environment in which we work on. And there are more challenging environments, and perhaps West Africa represents a more challenging environment, and yet there's possibility to be a leader in any environment. And then self-assessment to check once in a while with oneself, am I going the right way or not? And on the exercise of leadership, there are two things that are important as I see it. One is to bring into the inner circle the right people, and the other one is once you have the people in the place, manage them. And by management, I mean give those people an opportunity to develop themselves to the ultimate extent and there's a very nice book that was published last year by Dr. Liz Weissman called Multipliers that talks about four values that leaders can exercise. Look for talent. This is what I told you about recruitment. Look for what is natural and engage that. Utilize the talent once you have them. Make those connections among people. Help people connect to other people that will advance their cause. And then an important one, a very important one, remove yourself and remove the barriers from those people. Sometimes leaders tend to cast such a shadow on the followers that impair the followers from achieving their own uh, will. I have some little personal secrets on leadership. I have looked and studied leadership aspects of animals in different kingdoms. And I have realized that this is a balance between authority, courage, and service, where the balance tilts a lot onto the service line. This flock of birds here are following one bird 
one bird that has the trust of all the others to find the food and to find the appropriate place. Which leads me to this little diagram with which I believe I can express leadership to you. The leader and the followers are united by a bond, and that bond is a bond of trust. That bond is very important to remember, and in my next few slides, I will tell you about that bond, because in the past, that bond used to be established by authority, by the theory of the carrot and the stick. You do something right, me as your leader, I am going to help you there. In the present, that bond is what we call the transformational type. It's a type in which the bond is established by purpose and by meaning. In other words, the job of the leader is no longer the job of telling somebody what to do, it's the job of showing somebody what has meaning in life, what has importance to society, and then allowing the followers to do it. In, in, in order to cement that bond, it is important that the leader listen, listen carefully and without hurry. It is important that the leader try to understand, that the leader give time and resources, that give meaningfully, that shares the time with the followers, and to help somebody and give them credit. When those things happen, you will remember that people will feel good. And people, as somebody once said, forget everything, everything you have ever said, but they never, ever, forget how you make them feel. With that in mind, I believe that leadership has a lot to do with love. Love makes for better leaders, it makes for better surgeons, and it makes for better people altogether. And in leadership, love, as Dr. Sawin says, can be expressed by active listening. That is the listening that means when you talk, I listen. I listen by trying to interpret what you're saying. With great humility, that means knowing I may not own the truth. And with respect, that means perhaps what I'm listening to is a great idea. These actions of love connect people in a very special way, and they are essential to cement that trust that I told you about before. In a book that Manby wrote last year, which calls Love Works, he has a chapter on leading with love. And he says, these are the seven aspects of leading with love. Be patient, be kind, be trusting, be unselfish, be truthful, be forgiving. There's nothing like letting grudges go and be dedicated to your own values. In other words, my friend, I am a firm believer that in leadership, the heart is much more important than the brain. In other words, emotional intelligence eats intellectual cohesion every day for lunch. So let me finish with four aspects of leadership on how to exercise leaders, how, how leaders do it, and give you for each one of the four a little example that I have chosen for you. The leader must be able to create a vision. Creating the vision means bringing significance and purpose. Remember what I said, leadership has evolved into a world of meaningful and purposefulness and away from the authority and the power. Shared vision, meaning for the people that are involved. The leader has to be able to talk directly to the people that are involved. It must be anchored in reality. It just can't be a dream. It has to be something that people would buy into, and it has to mitigate risk. My example comes from the book that Samuela de Bonojo wrote about the development of open heart surgery in West Africa. In the third page of that book, Professor Ajay wrote with regards to the development of heart surgery in Africa, money is not the only thing. No amount of money will advance open heart surgery in West Africa without the things that make money work for us. 
And here's the vision that I was talking about before. Determination, dedication, enterprise, self-confidence, appropriate health and non-health manpower development, patriotism, coordinated national and international health development issues, and the promotion of regional centers of excellence. This is a way to have a vision that is anchored in reality, that expresses a dream, but at the same time has a clear anchor in reality. Second thing the leader must do once the vision is crystallized in the leader's mind is to articulate that purpose. And it has to be articulated with passionate determination to achieve goals and vision, offering a strong point of view that focuses on everyone's shared vision, delineate clear expectations from followers, and act with determination to achieve. And I chose for this second part two examples. One is from the past, and it shows you what kind of leaders people were looking for, and one is from the present. The one from the past comes from an ad that Ernest Shackleton in 1914 published to recruit people to go to an Antarctic expedition. And he said, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, <laughs> honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> now, he managed in 1914 to get a lot of people. Last year, I was looking at one airline mandate that all their pilots carry in, their, in the back of their, of their tablets, and it reads like follows. And you'll see the difference between leadership then and leadership now. It says, serve from the heart. Love what you do. This is for pilots. Improve something today. Seek first to understand. Deliver on commitments. Make the most of what you have. He did not, even if you have little. Keep calm. Ask for help. Make mistakes valuable. And have fun. Now, the third aspect of this after you have concreted your vision, after you articulate your vision, is to generate and to maintain the trust, that bond that unites leaders with followers. And for that, there's nothing better than being the role model. And that, we say, to walk the walk, to do what you say, not to ask others to do something you don't do. I always laugh, incidentally, at parents that are telling children, don't smoke while they are smoking. <laughs> smoking is bad for you. How, how can that message ever? Listen carefully to followers. Communicate candidly with them. Act with reliability. There's nothing more important in the shared vision model than the follower knowing what the leader is going to do. Encourage openness. Encourage dissent. Ask people to tell you what is wrong with your idea and express confidence in followers. And for this, my example is Pope Francis. I don't know whether you are Catholic or Muslim or Protestant. This is a man that walks the walk. This is a man that inspires the followers. This is a man that says, this is what is right for a person of my stature to do, and he will wash the feet of the poor because that is what God told him to do. And the last one is the action. Convert purpose into vision, into action. You had the vision, you articulated, you cemented that trust with your followers, and then you have to ask. As you are asking, listen to your followers. They know usually the better way to go. Be comfortable with failure. Because leadership, leadership has a lot of moments when you fail, and you have to remember that you have feel to be comfortable with failure. If you never fail, that means only one thing. You never try to do something difficult. 
Leaders are to be pragmatic dreamers or practical idealists. And to end, let me give you my college, the American College of Surgeons, moral compass when it comes to leadership. And the American College of Surgeons has five words that they express that leaders must have as their moral compass. And those words are professionalism, meaning compassion, meaning acting with altruism, meaning acting with other people's interest in front of yours. Excellence, meaning doing whatever you do the absolute very best you can do it. Whether you have resources or you don't, whether you live in a poor country or in a rich country. Innovation, meaning embracing new things, new processes, new functions as they can be done. Introspection, meaning stop every day and look into your heart, look into your soul and let your soul di direct the questions to your mind. And inclusion, meaning take everybody, no matter what color of the skin they have, no matter what religion they express, no matter what sexual expression they have, take everybody because when you mesh everybody, you get the best ideas. So this is what we call PEIQ for professionalism, excellence, and then innovation, introspection, and inclusion. So, thank you. So, two parting thoughts that I have, and one more slide. One of them is that leadership is doing what is right, not what one has the right to do. <laughs> and that is important to remember. Because when you come to a position like I have come, or like many of you in this room have come of power, of authority, there is a tendency to see that almost anything you want to do gets done. But the important thing is to have that moral compass to tell you you're only going to do what is right. And my other important thought is something that Martin Luther King said in 1968, just before he was killed. And that is, a good leader is obedient to the unenforceable. That means a good leader leads beyond the laws, beyond the regulations, because a good leader leads from the soul. <clears throat> Here are two examples of great leaders and great friends. <laughs> Monsieur le Président, the Professor Ajay. And with that, I would, I would like to thank you all for listening to me today. I would like to thank you again for the great honor of Honorary Fellowship in your talk. Thank you. Seat. The
we are processing in reverse order. We said in reverse order. were wonderful and uh, the honorary awardee spoke on leadership it was fantastic in fact i'm blessed in fact i'm happy that i'm here to witness this great occasion it is your first time in, Ab in abidjan brilliant the first time your first time yes I'm, exci you can see I'm, I'm excited okay you know and the attendance was impressive mm -hmm. the minister of health came representing the his Excellency and uh, other dignitaries. I mean, it was impressive. We can hope that you come back in Abidjan next time. Of course, I will vote for that. A big yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. It was a it was a great event. Um, the music was marvelous, and uh, the speeches were very good. Uh, and I particularly appreciated the speech by the president uh, of the West African College of Surgeons. Um, he uh, is a very wise man and a great leader. Uh, and it was a great privilege to be here too when uh, um, Professor Carlos Pellegrini received his honorary fellowship from the college. It was a great event for the college and for, 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 for Professor Pellegrini. He's a great man. It's your first time in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire? It is my in first Abidjan. time in Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, okay, okay. uh, you are a surgeon also? I am an orthopedic surgeon ah, okay. in, in Scotland, on Ecosse. Well, I have been made to feel very, very welcome here in Côte d'Ivoire. It's been very good. I've really enjoyed my visit here. I look forward to coming back again. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Professor Elizabeth Ogoli Nwaso. I'm an anesthesiologist from Nigeria. Um, my impression about the opening ceremony of the 55th West African College of Surgeons Annual Conference is that it is very good and it's a good success and I'm happy to be here in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, happy that the Minister for Health and Sanitation was here at the opening ceremony to represent uh, the President. That is also very good. This is the mace. It's called the mace. It's the symbol of authority of the president of the West African College of Surgeons. So without the mace, the authority to move, to process as a president and fellows of the college, we cannot do that. So the mace is uh, made of uh, metal and uh, on it is the snake the healing snake 
on a stick. It's a symbol of medicine and it's from the times of the Bible in the time of Moses when the people were beaten by uh, snakes and he raised a snake stick and the snakes stopped biting them and they were healed, they were okay. So that has become the symbol of medicine as a profession of doctors, physicians and surgeons internationally all over the world. They use the healing snake on a stick. That's this is it. your first time in Abidjan? This is my first time in Abidjan. How do you uh, find Abidjan? I find it, it's a beautiful place. I like the Hotel Ivoire, Sofitel, and uh, Kokodi. It's very nice. And I went through the pond, the gates, uh, with, uh, over the sea. It was, it's interesting.